very much today in our service we're thinking about the greatness of our God and one of the things about our God is that he is a holy God he is perfect in all his ways but sadly that is not true of you and me and as we come into his presence we need to say sorry to our God would you join me in these words of confession almighty God our heavenly father we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. And the special prayer for today. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King, and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end. For he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. We're about to have our first reading, and it's from the book of Daniel. It's just a part of chapter 2. To understand this reading, you need to know that the king of Babylon has had a very bad dream. He takes it as a bad sign. He takes it seriously. He wants to find out the, the meaning of his dream, but no one can tell him. And we see Daniel's response to this in our reading. The 
reading is taken from Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God for ever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and opposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God, my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Ariosh, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not ex execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariosh took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king that his dream, what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what, it, what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O King, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. May we bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, give us understanding that we may hear and know what it is you want to say to us this morning. Amen. Now there are two key things that I want to draw out of Daniel chapter 2. One is that God really wants to communicate with us. And the second is that God is in control. I think if we let those points really sink into our hearts and minds, uh, then our lives will be changed. Daniel chapter 2 starts off with King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, having some bad dreams. It's not surprising really. His early reign saw many border disputes. There were external threats. So troubled dreams is almost what you'd expect. But get this. God was at work in his dreams. It's an incredible thing when you stop and think about it. And who does God communicate with in this way? Is it just nice people? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't really fit that category. Was he a friend of God? Well, hardly. He'd already deported many of God's people, and in a few years' time he would destroy the city of Jerusalem. I wonder, do you and I really believe in a God who communicates? What does this mean when we pray for, say, the leader of North Korea, or of China, or of the United States of America? Do we believe that God wants to speak to them? That he can speak to them? Why do we doubt that God has a passion to communicate? Nothing could show more clearly his desire to get through to us than his taking of human flesh 
and living among us, how could he speak more clearly, more relevantly, more sensitively? And Daniel is a man who follows God's lead in communicating. He sees what God is doing and in a sense he helps. Daniel really engaged with Babylonian culture. He has listened and he knows how to present God's message. And I stress this because God wants to speak to the people of Hereford. The ones who never even think of coming to church. And he wants to use you and me. But the best sharer of the good news is not necessarily the one who loves the Christian gospel so much that they can't help but share it. The best sharer is one who loves people so passionately that they cannot but want the best for them. Obviously you need to know that people really need the gospel of Jesus. But the point that I want to make is that we need to listen to people and to love them before we'll know the best way to share the message. Compared to lots of people, I probably have a fairly clear understanding of the good news of Jesus. But there are times when I find myself practically speechless when listening to someone, because I really don't understand that person well enough to know how to share the gospel with them. I cannot see things through their eyes clearly enough to know how to present Jesus to them. This need to listen to our culture and to find ways to bring the, the amazing message of Jesus, to bring it to life to a new generation, this is such a vital task. In Acts chapter 17, we see the Apostle Paul struggling to do this. He finds himself alone in the great city of Athens. He's waiting for his travelling companions to arrive. He wanders around the city. He's deeply distressed by all the signs of pagan worship. But he is thinking and praying as he wanders. And he comes up with a magnificent sermon in Athens. Let me give you a, a, a snippet of it. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Do you have that desire to communicate the message of Jesus? Are you asking God to pour out his love for others into your heart so that you're engaged with people and listen to them and be able to reach them with the good news of Jesus? I think the book of Daniel helps us in this because it really does encourage us and reminds us just how much our God wants to communicate. And it's a story still being repeated today in the Middle East, often with people who have little, if any, contact with other Christians. God is speaking to individuals in their dreams. They see Jesus in their dreams. They hear him and they respond to him. So back to Daniel chapter 2. The king was having bad dreams, dreams from God. And, and dreams in that society, bad dreams were seen as bad omens. So the king is really upset. How frustrating to be so powerful and yet not to be able to control your dreams. We love to think that we're in control. But actually, as this virus reminds us, we are not. But the king has in his courts, so many people. Surely some of them can help him. After all, he has magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, we're told, and he has the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans were the dream specialists. And, of course, they're very eager to help. But there's a problem. The king won't tell them the dream. They not only have to work out the meaning, they have to work out the dream as well. Now, the Chaldeans had books 
full of the meanings of dreams, but that only worked if they knew what the dream was. And there's an argument between the king and the Chaldeans, and it gets pretty heated. The king is offering them great rewards if they do what he wants, but he also threatens them that they're going to be wiped out if they don't tell him the answer. The Chaldeans are desperate. How can they interpret a, de- a dream? They don't even know what it is. They tell the king, there is no one on earth who can reveal what the king demands. The thing that the king is asking is too difficult and no one can reveal it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. But the king is not having this. He thinks that they're just trying to get him to reveal his dream and then they'll come up with any sort of answer and he will have no confidence in it. You see, the king was not a stupid man, but he also wasn't a very nice man either. Because at the refusal of the Chaldeans, the king flies into such a rage, and that's not just the Chaldeans, the magicians, the enchanters, and the sorcerers that are going to get it in the neck. It's now all the wise men of Babylon, including Daniel and his friends. But perhaps it wasn't just self-interest that that motivated Daniel to help. Daniel knew that God wanted to speak to the king of Babylon. And so Daniel goes to the king and asks for a bit of time so that he might understand the king's dream. And then, as we heard in our reading, Daniel calls his friends to pray with him so that the mystery of the dream might be revealed. What incredible faith to believe that God would answer such a specific prayer. Can you imagine praying that prayer? Praying that God would reveal to you the dream that he's given to someone else and that would reveal the interpretation as well. It's an amazing prayer and it's so refreshing to see this group of friends praying about real issues facing them. What was needed wasn't a strategy session or a planning meeting. What was needed was prayer. So often we seem to do everything but bring to God the everyday problems and pressures that we face. Yes, we might pray about someone who's ill, but not about what's going on in our work, in our lives, in our relationships. We have categories where we seem to think that God is either not interested or else he can't do anything about it. The other great thing that appears in our reading is that that when Daniel gives thanks to God for revealing the mystery to him, his prayer really puts God at the centre. The focus when we pray should not be our problems though it is important that we bring them to God, our focus should be God himself. And Daniel praises God, that God is in control and that God reveals his purposes. Our God is not, as our culture suggests, powerless or silent. Perhaps most people do not want a God who talks and acts. During one opinion poll, people were asked if they believe in a God who acts in history. One reply was, no, I just believe in the ordinary one. Sometimes I wonder if our view of prayer reflects this. Often we seem to see prayer almost just as a, a sort of as a release. Uh, it's good to get things off your chest. But we don't really expect God to answer or to act. Daniel praises God for his wisdom and strength, but also says that God longs to give that strength and wisdom to people like you and me. And it's not just the book of Daniel that has this message. In the letter of James, chapter 1, verse 5, we read, If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 reminds us that the power of Christ 
dwells in us. When Daniel goes before the king, I love the contrast. There is Ariok the king, the king's chief executioner, who's trying to make the king take notice of him. Ariok says, I've done it, I've done it, I've found someone who can tell you what the dream means. But Daniel, when he's asked by the king, do you have the answer, says, no. But I know a God who does. It's a bit like those AA adverts which shows motorists in various states of distress and incompetence. The crunch question comes, can you fix it? To which the answer is no, followed by a cheerful, but I know a man who can. Daniel is determined that all the praise goes to God. And then Daniel tells the king the dream and its interpretation. The king has dreamt of a statue with a gold head and then silver chest and arms, then stomach and thighs of bronze, and then has come legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And Daniel says this depicted a series of empires that would come, kingdoms that God appoints. Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Golden Empire. But then in his dream, the king had seen a stone cut out by human hand, sorry, cut out not by human hands. The stone broke the statue, and the statue became like dust that was blown away. And the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. And this stone, said Daniel, was God's kingdom that would bring all these other kingdoms to an end. God's kingdom would stand forever. It was, to say the least, quite a dream. And Rob is going to be saying more about the dream and its meaning next week. Like so often when God speaks to us, the king took from it really only what he wanted. He had a reassurance that his throne was at least safe. He didn't take from it the message that God was the one, in fact, who had given him his authority. It did not make him a humble king. It did not make him a seeker after the kingdom of God. However, the king was extremely grateful for an answer for his pesky dreams. And we have this incredible scene at the end of chapter 2 of the most powerful man in the world in those days lying prostrate before an exiled Jew. It's a picture to hold in your mind. God is in control. He can put dreams into people's heads, even the head of the mightiest king. He can give wisdom to his servants. He is in control of history. People have talked of a thousand-year Reich, or of the Berlin Wall lasting a thousand years, but human plans, human empires will fall to dust. Many people have used some of the dreams and visions in Daniel to try and work out a complicated timetable for the future. But they were probably not meant to give a timetable. They were meant to give a theology. History is his story. It's not an accident. It's the almighty God who is working his purpose out. His kingdom is coming. Not in a land far away from here or in a galaxy far away. It is coming here on earth. And it will last forever. And that is why you and I have been commissioned to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And we're going to have a worship song now that encourages us to focus our hearts and minds on the King.
Would you please stand as we affirm together our faith in God. We believe and trust in God the Father who made the world. We believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind. We believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please sit or kneel for our prayers of intercession? Abba Father, as we draw near to you, we remember what a wonderful God you are, a loving, caring Father who has adopted us into your family and made us sons and daughters of God. You alone are great and mighty, who created and sustains the whole universe. And yet you delight in us and are so pleased to hear our worship and our prayers. As we worship you this morning, we remember that we're just a part of a great company of faithful people around the world who today are also bringing to you their praise. Father, we love you and adore you. And now we offer you our lives as a living sacrifice in spirit and in truth. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. First of all, we thank you that your gospel is spreading fast across China, Africa, Iran, and South America. And we also pray for the persecuted church where your people are in prison, murdered and marginalized. We pray for your church in China, in Egypt and Nigeria, Father, have mercy on your people, protect and provide them according to the riches of your grace. We bring to you the continuing situation in Syria where Assad's regime with Russians are still bombing and killing people, including children. We remember Yemen where so many are suffering because of Iran's sponsored terrorism. Father, may your kingdom come into these situations. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own country. We pray for our Prime Minister, Mr. Boris Johnson, and for every member of Parliament, remembering Jesse Norman and Bill Wiggin, that you will help and support all of them in their work as they're dealing with this dress, dreadful coronavirus which has had such a devastating effect on the lives of so many people with bereavement, loss of livelihood, interrupted education and the deterioration in our economy. We thank you that our government have put the well-being of people first. Father, may you strengthen the work of their hands O oh, High King of Heaven, have mercy on our land. Revive your church. Send the Holy Spirit for the sake of the lost and the broken. And may your kingdom come to our nation in the mighty name of Jesus. In your mercy, hear our prayer. And we just lift up those who are sick. 
Let's quietly name them before the Lord in this short time of silence. Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus to meet the needs of our sisters and brothers that they might truly know how much you love and help them. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Gathering our prayers and praises together, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. God sent Jesus to bring us peace with him and peace with one another. And our service ends by the sharing of the peace with one another. So would you please stand? We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Amen.